Welcome back, everyone. My name is Michael LeBlanc, Director and Senior Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. And thanks for joining us here today on Mike on Money, uh, where we dive into everything financial once a week. And uh, on Tuesdays, we do a live market update. So thank you, everyone who's joining. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, you can reach us at mikeonmoney.com. You can uh, give us, send us an email, give us a call, and also uh, you can directly access my calendar right there if you want to make some time. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity, uh, something we all hear about, something we're all cautious about, but uh, you know, how do we invest in that? Uh, we've had it in our portfolios since early 2019, and we continue to see it as a great growth area. And we're going to have a special guest today. We're, we're going to talk about uh, how that sector has developed, how it's growing, and uh, what to look for. So I'll go there momentarily. As always, remember everything we talk about here is information purposes only. Don't take it as advice for your personal portfolio or financial plan. If you do have some questions, you want to explore how you can apply these things to your portfolios, Give us a call, go to that mikeonmoney.com. Happy to answer any of your questions or do your own due diligence before, um, before do applying anything into your portfolio. So with that, um, I'm going to bring on our guest speaker today, Raj Lala from Evolve ETFs, uh, a great guy. And I'm gonna just turn on his video. And here we have Raj with us. Raj, thanks for joining us uh, Hi, Michael. today. So thanks for uh, uh, thanks for having me on. Not at all. Uh, so for for those listening, um, <laughs> Raj and I've known each other for for a little while. We used to get together in Vancouver. Unfortunately, you're not allowed out here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> someday uh, soon, I hope. Someday soon. Well, we just we actually just shut travel. Like uh, unnecessary travel can't come into the Lower Mainland anymore for uh, for two weeks anyway. So. Um, so hopefully we'll have that open for the new year. But in the meantime, this is a, a good venue. I hope that we can uh, at least uh, at least get this out to to people. So Raj, you know, one thing before we, we jump into the, the cyber cybersecurity um, evolve. Is this your third anniversary? You guys been around now? Yeah, that's right. We just crossed through uh, three years at the end of September. It's been, uh, it's been pretty good for us. I mean, this year specifically, even though obviously our world has changed a lot and uh, our lives have been somewhat turned upside down, I think for, for our business, it's actually been quite positive uh, from an inflow perspective of assets. In fact, we've doubled our assets uh, since, since the middle of March. So today we're sitting at uh, over 1.2 billion in assets in uh, just over three years. Uh, been one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing independent ETF issuer in the country. And I think that's, you know, a testament to early adopters such as yourself uh, and your clients who started using the fund. And uh, we've also obviously been very fortunate to have some great performance uh, in, a, in a number of our products. I think, you know, in March, when the markets took on significant volatility, uh, it was it was obviously very challenging for us to all deal with and you know in that month of March there was actually only five funds uh, five ETFs in Canada out of 580 equity ETFs that had positive performance and we were very fortunate to have three of those five and they continued to do well in the rebound uh, also so uh, yeah it's been it's been a, it's been a good year from a business perspective that's excellent yeah well, and you guys started up, you know, three you know, just three years ago, but it's a very competitive space, as you mentioned, some of those numbers. Um, you know, I've always been impressed how you guys have, have, you know, not only taken the bold approach, but I think, you know, the wise approach uh, of coming in with, uh, you know, focusing on niche markets like cybersecurity. And do you think that's kind of lended to, to that success or? Yeah, it's funny, you know, in 2016, when I started to put Evolve together, I remember having many conversations with other industry colleagues and friends and nine out of 10 of them said, you're nuts. Like, why would you want to put together an ETF in, uh, business today? It's so competitive. It's, uh, it's, it's so congested. You don't have a distribution network. And I said, well, you're absolutely right. I, I probably would be nuts if I was you know, going to try and create another TSX 60 ETF or a Dow 30 ETF. I mean, that, that space is very well covered, but 
I've always been a big believer in really two components. One is I've always been a big believer in elements of active management as it relates to areas such as fixed income. And I've also uh, been a huge believer in thematic uh, ETFs or thematic industries. And that's where we've gotten a lot of our media attention over the last few years, because I think what we've done is we've been very thoughtful about how we've brought these products to market. You know, first of all, we, we look at areas of the market that have a really long-term investment thesis. Cybersecurity is a perfect example of that. But then on top of that, making sure that you're giving investors exposure to companies that they don't necessarily already have exposure to with minimal overlap to the traditional uh, indices and giving investors a way to express a view uh, that they might have on a specific area. So I, I often refer to our products as kind of conversational alpha because it's something that you can sit across the table from and have an interesting discussion around cybersecurity, around the electrification of the car, around e-gaming, for example. Uh, they're pretty interesting areas and for some maybe a little bit more interesting than talking about uh, bond yields. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Especially these days. Yes. Um, so let's talk about cyber. Let's, let's talk about the industry uh, specifically. Uh, you know, obviously we hear about, you know, I think as a general public, we hear about the breaches with some of these big companies. But, you know, when we look at, you know, corporations as, as an investment, you know, how, how do, you know, why is the need there, right? Like as, as a company or CEO, what do they look at when they're looking at cybersecurity? Yeah, so maybe start with kind of a, Effectively, cybersecurity is there to protect our most precious resource today. Now, I know people think that oil is a precious resource and maybe gold is a precious resource, but in today's world, data has become, if not the most, one of the most precious resources. So the protection of that data has become effectively a non-discretionary spend on behalf of companies. Now, in today's world, we've generated about 90% of the world's data that exists has been generated just in the last five years alone, and it's doubling every, every two years. And the reason why is because we're producing so much data because we're so connected uh, around the world today. I mean, most people are really surprised to hear the number. We have 25 billion devices connected online today. That's three per person on the planet, right? I mean, that's your phone, that's your watch, that's your computer, your iPad, your thermostat, your alarm. So we live in an increasingly connected world. And the purpose of that connectivity is obviously to make us more efficient and productive and in some ways happier. But what that also means is we're producing vast amount of data and we're also providing hackers or cyber criminals multiple access points to access that data. But more importantly, that connectivity is not going to be reducing any time. In fact, over the next five years, we're going to be growing to 75 billion devices connected online, which is 10 per person on the planet. So the need for cybersecurity has become really important. And you, you know, one of your points in your question was about the CEO. So think about it. If you're the CEO of a major organization, um, the last thing you want to happen to your organization is a breach of data. Uh, in fact, most times if you hear a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or even a Canadian bank speaking, if somebody asks them that question as to, you know, what's the number one thing that keeps you up at night, nine times out of 10, they'll say it's a potential cyber breach. Because if, you, if your data gets breached and it gets out there in the, in the open world, um, you've lost customer trust potentially forever. And in the example of our Canadian banks, We've got six banks here in Canada or six primary banks in Canada. Customers would just go to another bank and you've lost that loyalty. You're going to take a massive hit to your stock price. And there's a high likelihood that you're not going to be the CEO after a few months after an attack like that. So regardless of whether we're going through an economic expansion or a recessionary environment, um, cybersecurity has become a non-discretionary spend. So I almost say like, like it's basically the utility section of the technology industry. Right. So it sounds like CEOs and boards, when they look at it, like the cost of attack, you know, is, is so large that that's, that budget is justified, I guess. In yeah. 
Absolutely. I mean, if, if the cost of, I mean, sometimes it's very difficult to quantify uh, the cost of an attack because how do you necessarily quantify that loss of customer trust? Because then you have to do things like factor in that cost of customer acquisition uh, as well, that all that time that went into building that customer trust and loyalty and building that fence around the customer and you lose it like that. I mean, Equifax was the, is probably the poster child example of that. It three, just over three years ago, uh, they had a massive breach of 143 million records. It wasn't about the username and password, though, that was taken. It was the high quality data. It was date of birth. It was social security number or social insurance number. It was your credit card debt outstanding. It was your home address. It was all of those things. And the moment that they reported that breach of 143 million records, their stock dropped in that first week 35%. Now, most customers and, and most partners of theirs decided, well, we're not going to go back to Equifax because we've got other options. So they went to companies like TransUnion and they never ended up going back. Again, every CEOs, every boards, every shareholders, worst nightmare um, to, to have a breach like that. It's just something that has become so relevant to organizations worldwide. And like I said, that's why the spend has become non-discretionary in terms of that protection. So... So with all the spend and kind of obviously the increase in need, um, do you guys, have you guys been able to quantify kind of how large this market is as far as kind of a, do, a total kind of industry? Yeah. So cyber crime is expected to cost the global economy about $6 trillion wow. next year. Okay. So 2021. That's more than, put that number into perspective, that's more than the GDP of countries like Germany or Japan. So it's massive. The spend on cybersecurity or the revenue that's generated for cybersecurity companies today is about $160 billion, uh, which by the way is, in, in, interestingly enough, um, effectively the same size or the same amount of revenue that's generated by our Canadian banking sector uh, as well, and about 50% more than our Canadian real estate sector. So uh, this is not a small industry and, 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 it's, and it's growing faster than the Canadian banking sector uh, and the real estate sector. It's averaging about 20 to 22% growth uh, per year. So in a few years, that industry, the cybersecurity industry is gonna be over 200 billion. So it's, it's a lot larger than people. A lot of times when you're talking to prospective investors, they think it's a little bit too niche. -y. It's not as niche -y as you might think. And there's a, there's a lot of money going into it right now. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to stop using the word niche for it and uh, <laughs> just, just say it's part of your asset allocation. Um, well, with all that kind of growth, um, how, how is it, for, you know, obviously these companies are growing at, at massive rates. Uh, how are they, are they finding talent, right? Like, you know, are there, is it just a specialty that, uh, that they, can, they can easily access or is it, you know, a, a difficult area? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, if any of you have kids that are trying to figure out a career path for themselves that are in that, those teen years or even early twenties, you may want to nudge them towards a career in cybersecurity because in today's world, uh, there's a shortage of about three and a half million people in the cybersecurity industry. It is one of the very few industries that has negative unemployment uh, right now and. That is the reason why so much of the cybersecurity work uh, is outsourced. I mean, I'll give, you, I'll give you a great example. A typical Canadian bank would have about anywhere between 20, depending from about 20 to 50 people working within their cybersecurity department at their bank. But a typical Canadian bank will also have between three to five million attempted breaches per day, per day. So there's no way a staff of 30 to 20 to 50 people could comb through that. So what, what happens a lot of times is they contract out the lion's share or they outsource the lion's share of their cybersecurity work to one of the big firms and, uh, and let them comb through, you know, the 99% of the threats that are not an imminent threat and, they, and bring to their attention, the internal cybersecurity department, bring to their attention the 1% that they need to be uh, very concerned about. So because of that human capital shortage, 75% of all the cybersecurity work that is performed for our Fortune 500 companies and government agencies worldwide is outsourced. Wow. And usually 
um, nine times out of 10, it's going to get outsourced to the big reputable cybersecurity companies, highly unlikely that they're going to outsource that work uh, to a small mom and pop shop cybersecurity firm, which is one of the reasons why our fund has done so well in the last few years, because they keep getting more and more contracts. And one important point, extension point, is, you know, cybersecurity is not a one-time spend. An organization can't say, oh, Million dollars on my cybersecurity infrastructure, and I can walk away now. It's a continuous spend because cyber criminals are continuously becoming more innovative uh, in their in their cyber crime. So uh, it's, that's what's great about it for the cybersecurity companies is they have all of this recurring revenue that's coming into their businesses. Yeah. So I get well, and it sounds like because it's outsourced, uh, you know, when we see these dollars. You know, it's an they're investable dollars. You you know, usually the companies spending money on internal staff. I mean, that's not you know really people can't uh, invest in something and, and benefit from that spend. Right. But if these dollars are going to outside companies where we can invest in that growth, uh, that's where the portfolio is taking advantage of it. Yeah, seventy five percent outsourced. Wow. Um, so I mean, obviously the world has changed um, mm-hmm. since since early this year. So uh, and your fund's been around. Was it 2018, 2017? No, uh, yeah, just over three years now. It was, it was, uh, it was one of our first funds that we launched. Right. So, how have you seen the the COVID nineteen impact kind of the sector as far as opportunities and and changes? Yeah. So we obviously all got vaulted into this work from home environment. You know, hundreds of millions of people around the world went from working in an office to working at home. Um, Companies were not prepared uh, clearly to, uh, to uh, protect them because there's one, it's one thing to protect your central data uh, in, your, in your office. It's quite another thing to put a fence around every single person's home that's using a Rogers network or a Bell network or a TELUS network uh, for, their, for their internet. And so there was two things that uh, really kind of kicked into high gear uh, within cybersecurity. One was about 80% of the organization's were not prepared from an infrastructure perspective. So they needed to all go and upgrade their infrastructure. And also they were not, they had not properly trained their staff on how to use things like virtual private networks or uh, dual level authentication to access uh, the data. And the companies that did have the 20% that felt that they had enough infrastructure still lacked any training for their employees on how to use it. So cybersecurity companies got really busy um, with their with their clients to make sure that either they had the right infrastructure and or they also had the proper uh, training in place for their for their employees. So it was really it was really uh, an, an important time uh, in March and April uh, for that. Now cyber criminals knew that this was going on, so they knew that there was some susceptibility in the network. So attempted cyber crime increased by about 55% uh, between March and April. And, uh, and, you know, so far this year, for example, cyber criminals have made about $25 billion. Uh, so it's been a highly lucrative um, uh, uh, income or, or uh, salary grab uh, for the, uh, for the cyber criminals and the bad actors out there. Wow. Um, now, I mean, that's crazy increase, but uh, have they changed their, have they changed how they're attacking or, you know, is there a different approach that they're taking? Yeah. So, you know, I often say to people, you remember that thing from like 10, 15 years ago, that blue screen of death uh, where we had that on our laptop or our desktop and, you know, all of a sudden our screen went blue and uh, we got this entire message that your, your, your computer has been infected and basically you had two choices. You either threw away your computer or you, or you uh, had to rebuild your hard drive um, but there was no economic benefit to the, to the, to the bad actor or to the cyber criminal. It, really, there was just, they were just there to be a complete nuisance and be disruptive uh, to your daily life. But you know, as they got started, smarter, they realized that there could be a really great economic model for themselves. And that's where you started to see things like the Petia virus, the WannaCry virus, where um, cyber criminals would hijack corporate data or individual data, and they would demand a ransom. Could be a thousand dollars. It could be a hundred million dollars, depending on uh, depending on the size of the organization. And nine times out of ten, you if you paid that ransom, you got your data back. But the cyber criminals were making uh, a lot of money. And I always say that you know cyber 
cybersecurity is a little bit like your home security. So, you know, if you, you can parallel it a little bit. So let's say in our house, we get a, we get a home security system. What do we do? Well, we put the stickers up of ADT or Chubb or whoever the security provider is on all of the windows and we think we're safe. And then let's say, unfortunately, one time our house gets broken into. Our house gets broken into, you call the police, puts a list together, tries to figure out how the house got broken into, where the entry point was. You get your insurance company to come in and do a complete appraisal of all, the day, all of the things that were taken. And then what do you do after all of that? Well, you either get a better security system or maybe you buy a dog <laughs> or, something, or something like that. So cybersecurity is exactly, exactly the same thing where you, know, you, you, you build this fence around uh, your data and if uh, somebody breaches it, then the alarm goes off. And if they're still able to access it, then you have to go through that entire forensic uh, process and make sure that it can't happen again. So you beef up your contracts uh, to make sure that it's the only difference uh, is that cybersecurity companies don't typically advertise uh, sorry, companies don't typically advertise who the cybersecurity company is that is uh, providing that protection because true professional cyber criminals, when they know what the what the uh, what the expertise is of the cybersecurity companies are, they figure out ways to actually work around it. Just like a, a true um, uh, criminal knows how to, if they know how to break into a house, they probably know how to how to bypass an ADT system or bypass a uh, a Rogers system or something like that. So it's it's very much like it's very much like um, home security. Wow. Okay, but I want, I, I want to know the company, the first company that comes out with where I have a little dog on my screen and barks every time that someone's trying to attack me. <laughs> <laughs> because that idea. would be at least entertaining. It'd be at least <laughs> yeah, entertaining. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but that bark would send shivers down your spine. That's true, yeah. <laughs> well, it'd be going all the time, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so you describe like the, the you know, the criminals or, or the attackers, um, are these kind of like, you know, I, you know, sometimes we kind of imagine like the, 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 the genius kid in the basement or are these organized groups? You have a lot of, of different, um, you have professional groups. I mean, I think most people know that, uh, um, uh, there's a good number of groups that come out of Russia that, uh, that come out of China, uh, as well. We'll call them bad actors. Um, you, you do have the individuals as well. Uh, a lot of data is available on uh, the dark web uh, where people can buy and sell uh, as well. You know, unfortunately, what you was, uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily somebody externally, but it was somebody internally that would go and, let's say, load up a USB uh, drive and and then go and sell it on the dark web to somebody. Uh, so a lot of a lot of the uh, the cyber crime was actually taking place from internal. Today it's gotten a little bit better uh, with that because much of this is now done in the cloud instead of being done on hard drives. Uh, so it's definitely become a lot easier to manage the not easier but more effective to manage the internal uh, threat. The external threat though, yeah, there, it goes anywhere from individuals to highly, highly organized uh, teams or, or associations of, uh, of people out there. And look, I mean, when you start to talk about, you know, 25, 30, 35 billion that's being earned uh, by cyber criminals, guess what that's gonna spark? That's gonna just spark more cyber criminals and the existing ones just get more creative and more innovative. Wow. So. So when you look at the sector, um, you know, what do you, what are you seeing as far as trends go? Are, are certain, are certain, um, certain industries being targeted more? Is it pretty broad? Are we seeing growth in certain areas? Yeah. Um, the, the, the primary targets have been technology companies. You'd be surprised about, and part of the reason why not, uh, but part of the reason is, is that they have so much data uh, in their systems that accessing that data uh, is is priceless uh, for uh, criminals. The other target, unfortunately, has been hospitals. Hospitals uh, have not done a good job of um, of updating a lot of their technology infrastructure. They're still using very archaic uh, technology, so it's actually quite easy uh, for cyber for cyber criminals to access 
uh, that data. And, you know, unfortunately, we've heard lots of stories about people dying because um, because of, because of cyber breaches, because they can't get people to another hospital in time, and lots of lots of lots of nutty stories like you know uh, people hacking into other people's pacemakers and things like that. Like it's it's uh, it's 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 pre- it can be pretty it can be pretty terrible. Hospitals have definitely been a target. Municipalities have been a target as well because municipalities have a lot of information, especially all of the information around our property taxes and locations and so on. So for those would probably be like three of the, the, the biggest targets that, that we've seen. But remember, you know, it's interesting, pre-COVID, it's hard to remember our world pre-COVID, but pre-COVID, and I, when I mean pre-COVID, I mean January, um, you remember how the tensions between the US and, and Iran were really escalating that started kind of towards the, around this time, last year and then started to really bubble up uh, in, in January. Every, all of the experts, they weren't worried about a physical war between the US and Iran. What they had become very concerned about was a potential cyber war. And so what was happening during that period, you know, November, December, January, uh, was many of, many of the, the, the most important organizations, most important government agencies in the US really started to beef up uh, their cybersecurity work and, um, and their contracts uh, as well. So, so it's interesting that we're now getting into an era where physical wars are becoming less of a threat versus cyber wars because data has become our most precious resource. So it's, it's just, it's a, it's a different world we live in. I mean, it's obviously a different world uh, during COVID, but in general with technology and with, with this data circulation and production, it's, it's a very different world and you start to see how certain things become more valuable than others. Wow. Okay, well, I'm not going to ask you about TikTok because I've talked about that <laughs> the U.S. and the, the sure. battle with TikTok. So we're going to stay away from that one. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, you, you realize all of a sudden that becomes the, uh, that's who wins the war, right? Who controls the data in the end. That's right. Uh, so, you know, just branching on that, uh, I'm, you know, you, you talked about the healthcare. You know, I must imagine now a huge part of, uh, you know, when new companies are, you know, we're obviously one thing from COVID I think has been, you know, we want to find a silver line and is obviously, um, you know, technology has been a disruptor in many industries, but, uh, you know, you take healthcare, for example, with the virtual um, doctor visit, so the virtual uh, medical care, uh, which has been around for a while, but really didn't gain any ground, it's starting to gain ground. But, you know, these new industries coming out, they must have to build that cyber plan right out the gate these days. Like that has to be a big spend for them or, or a big focus of that, that, that plan. Yeah, it can cost an organization anywhere from 10% to 40% of their total infrastructure cost, depending how, on how important that cybersecurity platform is. And, you know, you hit a good point there with, uh, with telehealth. I mean, telehealth is... Um, I, I call telehealth a, a great example of a long-term behavioral shift that's taken place from COVID because you're absolutely right. Most people never used it before. Um, <clears throat> and now uh, like we had gone from 8% this year, this time last year, 8% of the Canadian population had used telehealth today, more than 40% have used uh, telehealth and it's going to grow. And so even when we come out of COVID, I think you're going to find that a big portion of the population, now that they've gotten used to using it, a big portion of the population is going to continue to use it. Ultimately, of course, you're going to, for certain ailments, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to uh, um, get a, have a physical visit uh, with your with your doctor or your your medical professional. But the bottom line is that when you when you look at all of that, you say, well, this is a long term shift. I'm, I'll give you a great example. Of my mom, my mom never used online banking before. She was forced to. She used to be one of those people that used to go and wait in the line at the bank. Remember those days? Uh, <laughs> wait in the line at the bank. And then uh, and then she used to have like her book and she'd get it updated. Now she's online. Now she's going from using online banking. She's now starting to use mobile payments uh, as well. And she's realized like, oh my God, I can't believe what I've missed over the last five years. It was so much, this is so much more efficient. So that's a long-term behavioral shift from covid as well, but both of those tie into technology. Um, both of those long-term behavioral shifts are a great testament to the use of technology, making us more efficient. 
And yes, to your point, that's why cybersecurity has become so much more important because these long-term behavioral shifts are causing us to use more technology that's also producing more data, which is obviously very important to protect. Wow. The, uh, yeah, no, and you're right. I, I, you know, you've seen so many um, talk about, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say the older generation, but you know, the, there's been an established group of people that did not want to, you know, whether it be e-commerce, uh, health, uh, banking, uh, that have been kind of forced and pushed. And, and now I think they've gotten very comfortable with it. So I do think that's going to grow. Um, but, you know, just kind of touching on one last trend, you know, on, on my thought of other industries. So it's not just, you know, it's not just that data side, you know, if I start to think about, um, you know, and you guys, uh, maybe I'm tapping into a little bit to one of your other funds, cars, uh, you know, the electric car, but the self-driving cars, obviously it's going to be very important to protect those from hacking. Um, as we've seen, uh, you know, when we talk about these bad actors around the world, I mean, that becomes a weapon if, if, if someone were to gain control of one of those vehicles. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people don't know, but 80% of your, of your uh, airplane ride uh, is autonomous as well. Pilots are not doing a ton right now. Uh, sorry, pilots are not doing a ton right now, period, unfortunately. But, right. but in general, over the last few years, uh, most of the flight that you were taking was being flown autonomously uh, through AI and through robotics. And uh, the pilot's there at the, at the wheel and to make sure that everything is okay. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, a cyber breach in, um, in autonomous or self-driving cars uh, could be, is one of the big concerns that companies have that are producing self-driving cars and governments have as, uh, as they start to look at uh, legalizing self-driving cars for our, for our mainstream roads, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's just, you know, just kind of using that as an example. And your good point about the planes, obviously, that was one of the, it was the AI kind of around the Max 8 problem with the 737 was a flaw in that programming, right? So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, I just see all these areas of, of, of extra spending. So, uh, you know, so when you're fun, when you, when you guys, are, what do you guys look for when you're looking to invest into cybersecurity? Like, what's one of the, some of the key factors? So, um, that's, that's a great question because I think it's important to highlight. This is not an actively managed fund. This is an index based fund. So it's passive. So what we work with is an organization called Solactive who are our index provider. They're the index provider now for probably about a quarter of all of the, uh, the ETFs here in Canada. Um, they utilize a service called FactSet which provides the categorization. So for cybersecurity, they would have categorizations for all companies that would fall into uh, that silo. And then that comprises our index. We market cap weight it, but we have a position limit of seven and a half percent. So we can't have more than seven and a half percent in any one single position. But ultimately you get more exposure to the bigger companies, less exposure to the smaller companies. I tend to believe for an industry like cybersecurity, that's important because um, the bigger companies tend to get the bigger contracts from the Fortune 500 companies because it just makes common sense. If you're a Fortune 500 company, that's one of the large ones, you probably want to go and work with the bigger, more reputable cybersecurity companies to provide that hardware, software, consulting services um, for you. So yeah, this is, a, this is an index-based strategy, market cap weighted. So... Um... Now, one of the trends I get asked a lot, a lot about is ESG investment or ethical, socially, and governance. Um, how, how would this fund kind of fall into that category? Is, you know, a lot of pension plans, a lot of institutionals are moving to that, that, that way as well? Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's the G. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's governance. governance. Um, it's, it, a fund like this is all about promoting uh, good governance uh, within your company to protect that data. Right. And do you see any of these companies? I know I'm stretching that, that area of the topic. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, with the recent U.S. election, we've seen a lot of, uh, of data being pumped out there by, let's call them hate groups, right? Or, or less, than, mm -hmm. less than socially responsible governance groups out there. Mm -hmm. uh, will some of these uh, providers uh, turn down uh, working with those, those types of organizations just you know, from an ethical or, or governance standpoint? 
Yeah, it does. It, it definitely happens. Um, there are a number of companies out there that we've, we've seen actually do that, but it's not, you know, the interesting part about that is it's not something that really gets made public that often because of the potential repercussions. Right, right. Well, no, you know, it's, I think for as an investors who are thinking ESG, you know, to know that, uh, because obviously we've seen, uh, not to choose a side here, but, you know, we, we have seen some of these hate groups uh, who have been ganged up by or attacks and, you know, you kind of get a little warm feeling when that happens. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to think that, you know, some of those big companies are out, are, are out there saying, I don't want to work with that. Uh, but to your point, it might not be advertised uh, because they don't really advertise who their clientele is in the first place. So that's right. That's uh, right. But, it, but they might say to... something like they might say something like 10% of the fortune 500 companies are our clients or something like that. But yeah, yeah. for the most part, they keep it very, low profile and that's that's primarily because of the customer's request right uh okay so uh a couple more things i want to touch on so i know every month i get an email from my um it department uh which it department now is encompasses so much more um but i get i have to do monthly training i have to go on and and and, and learn uh all about cybersecurity for the firm and, and what i can do uh and, and what I have taken away from that is, is people, the people in organizations are probably part of the, maybe not the largest risk, but, but a risk when it comes to cybersecurity prevention. Um, what kind of tips can you give people that they can do to, to protect themselves? Yeah, on your, on your point, though, I mean, I think every, and, and I'm happy to provide you some tips, but I think uh, every organization does those random tests, right? Where they send out an email that doesn't look like it's come from internal, looks like it's come from external and they're trying to test you to see if you actually click on that. So to date, there is not one organization in North America that has over a hundred employees that doesn't have at least one employee that clicks on that link. <laughs> not one. Now the numbers have gotten better because it used to be 10%, 12%. Now you're down to like three, four percent but you still have, and, and by the way, it just takes one to, to, to provide that entry, uh, that, that entry gateway for, uh, for a cyber uh, criminal to access. So I do think that we need to continuously train um, people. So as it relates to tips, um, first of all, uh, on path username, but more importantly, passwords, always make sure it's uh, alphanumeric with a cap capital letter uh, in there, you know, if you just have an alpha-based password, sophisticated cyber criminal can, can hack that within a couple of hours. If you have an alpha numeric along with a capital letter, it's years before a cyber criminal can actually access uh, that password. So always, always do that and always try to, I know it's a pain to, to change on a regular basis because you got to try and remember it later, but try to do it on a more regular basis. Don't just leave it, um, use the same alphanumeric password for, for forever. Uh, so that's, that, that's one. Second, with today's data plans, don't use public Wi-Fi. Uh, because I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bad idea. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, a hacker could go and set up shop outside of Starbucks. Now, the great news is most of us are not using public Wi-Fi because we're at home, but a hacker could go and set up a shop outside of a Starbucks and set up a server called Starbucks One. And you go to Starbucks and you have your coffee and then you look for the available servers um, and you see Starbucks and you see Starbucks One. So you click on Starbucks One. Now you've given a hacker, that hacker that's sitting there, an entire gateway to all of the information that you have in your network on your phone. So again, with today's data plan, you can just get away with just staying on your data, using your own Wi-Fi, try to stay away from public Wi-Fi. It's uh, not a good idea. Next thing, don't click on that link from a bank that you don't bank with if you get an email from them, even though it looks like an official logo and it's, it looks like it's great. If you don't have an account there, don't click on it. And, and very importantly, actually, and this, this transcends all of it, always scroll over the display name because the display name can always be changed. So somebody could change the display name to Canada Revenue Agency 
and that's the way it might show up on your in your on your email account. But if you actually look at what the email address is, that's where you will find out whether it's legitimate or not. Because most times, if it's illegitimate, you'll see some crazy obscure email ad Gmail address that's there, even though you thought it was one of the banks that you got it from or CRA or something like that. So always scroll over um, that display name. Uh, that's another tip. Actually, along those lines, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one really quick story because I know we're running out of time. Um, we get targeted all the time uh, running, our, running our company and, and cyber, cyber criminals are definitely mo much more sophisticated than they, than they used to be. And so we had a cyber criminal that went onto our website, saw that I was the CEO and emailed to everybody on my team because they got the names and they could figure out the email address that looked like it was coming from me saying, Hey there, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go, I need you to go to iTunes store and get me this gift card uh, for a client. Uh, and it's urgent because I'm in a rush right now. And so the, the, the logic from the cyber criminal is most employees want to please their boss. Uh, so they'll go and get that, 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 that card for them from iTunes store. Fortunately, I had somebody on my team who's not very tech savvy who called me up and said, Raj, um, I'm on my way to the mall right now. What time does the iTunes store open? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And he told me uh, about the email. So we were very, very fortunate. But the point from that is cyber criminals have become much, they're not just taking a spray and pray approach. They're, they're, they've become much more targeted in the way that they uh, go after uh, our data. So um, always scroll over that display name to make sure that it's the same person that you thought you were getting or same organization that you thought you were getting that, uh, that email from. Um, and then finally, uh, try as much as you can to use dual level authentication in your, uh, in your, uh, for your password. So have, have a code sent to your, to your cell number, um, use biometric in terms of your fingerprint, uh, as well, because dual level authentication can really help cut down on even if a hacker gets use of your password, very difficult for them. They, th th there is cyber cyber cr criminals that can try and access your SIM card in your in your phone, but that's very difficult for them to do. So uh, try and use dual level authentication. Those would be the key things that I think uh, most people should be looking out for to protect their data. Okay, those yeah, those, that, that's great. I, yeah, I know most a lot of companies have moved to that dual dual level and, uh, and obviously it adds that extra layer of protection that, um, you know, I guess the, the attackers or the actors have to really think, you know, is this really worth going through that extra effort if you have that in place, right? Um, you know, will it be profitable for them? So, uh, so yeah, so uh, with that, I mean, we, we've talked about cyber. I mean, obviously uh, we see a lot of growth going forward uh, for, you know, cybersecurity firms. Uh, the spend in is, uh, you know, almost through the roof for companies because you know it's unlimited risk. So obviously, uh, you know, you know, kind of uh, budgets there. Um, you've had some really great growth in the position, and and thank you for that. Our, you know, my clients, thank you for that. Um, can you comment quickly, kind of how you know you see this? You know, if we do go into recession, let's say the economy you know doesn't fully recover here, uh, or or you know eventually, obviously, uh, will go into recession. How how do you see this kind of holding up through that? Yeah, I often talk to people about recession resilience. And, you know, the first thing that, that they think about when they think about a recession resilient industry is investing in cash or gold uh, or even healthcare. And they all make sense uh, for sure. But, but in today's world, there exists some off the beaten track uh, recession resilient sectors. Like I would argue e-gaming is a great example because you know, um, uh, it's one of the lowest cost forms of entertainment. So if your disposable income decreases during a recession, you'll probably stay home and you'll game more uh, than anything else. Cybersecurity is, cybersecurity is another great example uh, of something off the beaten track, because as we've said in this, in this interview, it is one of the few areas of technology that has a non-discretionary spend. Companies cannot afford to decrease their spending. So let's, you know, let's create a scenario. One of our one of our banks has a terrible financial quarter uh, for, of financial results. And um, they've got to stand up in front of their shareholders and their board and their employees. Most likely what they're going to do is they're going to have to, you know, reduce headcount. They're going to have to close some branches. They're going to have to defer initiatives, but cybersecurity 
is not one of those areas that they can afford to reduce their spending on because uh, a cyber breach is, is a potential death knell uh, for their business. So that makes it very recession resilient, regardless of how, how great or how poorly a company is doing, they have to spend the appropriate amount of money to protect their data, to protect their career, to protect their stock price uh, as well. So to me, it's such a great area of the market uh, when you think about, you know, how do you find a place to invest that should do well during an economic expansion and should also do well uh, in an economic retraction? And cybersecurity is one of those uh, very few industries that, that fits that bill. Yeah, and I think, as you mentioned earlier, kind of March performance kind of showed that, right? While everything else was retreating, it, it kind of held in there. So uh, just to wrap up here, uh, you mentioned eGame and uh, just as a teaser, we're not going to dive into these today, but uh, certainly we, we, I would love to, uh, to do another deep dive into um, one of the other areas that you guys are offering. Maybe you can just cover off a few. Uh, you mentioned eGaming. Uh, what other ones that we have that would be really interesting to look at? Yeah, we, we've, got a, we've, got a, we've got a number of funds, obviously, in our, in our toolbox, but our eGaming fund is really interesting because uh, it's changed so much in the last 10 years. I mean, that's an example of an industry that's been around for a while, unlike cybersecurity. But a lot of us remember like e-gaming or gaming, video games, to be something like you get interested in a game, you go to the store, you buy the cartridge or the disc, you come home, you plug it into your console and away you go. That's where the revenue stream would stop for the e-gaming company. Today's world, you download the game for free, you have all of these in-app purchases, these boosters, these weapons, and so on. The company increase, the video game company increases engagement. They get all these other ancillary business lines of revenue from sponsorship, from media rights, from advertising, from usage, from all of those in-app purchases. And you have an industry that is just booming uh, right now. Like just to give you one quick stat, um, e-gaming is two and e the e-gaming industry is now two and a half times bigger than film and music combined. Wow. And television is about 260 billion. E-gaming is about 160 billion. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not going to take long, uh, for, for the e-gaming industry to actually, to actually catch up, uh, especially as, and when you think about it, especially as we move from playing games on consoles to playing games on our phone. Um, and there's 200 million consoles in the world and there's 4 billion smartphones in the world. So obviously you want to build your game for it, for the smartphone. So to me, that's really, that, that's really interesting. Our future of the automobile, um, ETF, you know, surrounds the whole concept of, we call it ACEs, autonomous, connected, electric, and shared, and all the supply chain companies, uh, that, uh, go into it. And then our, our most recent fund. And sorry, one of the other funds that we've been getting a lot of attention in is our healthcare fund because healthcare is so important and it's going to be instrumental in terms of getting our economy back, back to work and back on track. And a fund that we just launched uh, about a month ago that has, uh, has actually gathered a lot of assets in early on is uh, we, we took this, we put this product together that kind of, that looks at the blue chip companies of the past that have been leaders in their sector that we feel are going to continue to be leaders in their sector over the next five or 10 years. Combine in the emerging companies today that are not necessarily leaders in their sector, but we think are going to be uh, over the course of the next 10 years. And we've put that into a fund. So as you could gather from, from, uh, from this and from most of this, uh, this interview that we've been doing, we're huge believers in disruptive technology. We think disruptive technology is going to be so important um, over the next 10 years. And to kind of put it into numbers for you, there's been a lot of these reports that have come out. Over the next 10 years, we're going to be adding about $90 trillion to our equity market cap, right? $90 trillion. Half of that's going to come from disruptive technology. So if you don't embrace disruptive technology within your portfolios, you're going to miss out on a big chunk of the growth that's going to come out uh, of those portfolios. In Canada today, the average investor has 5% in disruptive technology. So we're definitely underweighted. And, and we're not suggesting to people that 
you know, that like I gave you that stat before about how cybersecurity is the same size as Canadian banking. I'm not suggesting to you that you have as much exposure to cybersecurity as you do to Canadian banking. What I'm suggesting to people is that, you know, the, these industries are much bigger than you might think they are. And they're industries that you really need to look at having a, a portion of your portfolio uh, allocated to. And that's, that's, that's where we're big proponents. Excellent. Uh, no, I, I 100% agree with you. You know, the, uh, I think Uber being an example of a disruptive technology to an existing um, industry that, uh, you know, didn't try to catch up, you know, the leaders of yesterday are not the leaders of tomorrow in all cases. And even, an even, an even better one is Netflix to Blockbuster. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is better because at least Netflix is profitable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, fair, fair point, fair point. <laughs> so listen, uh, I want to wrap it up, be respectful of uh, time. Raj Lala, CEO of Evolve, thank you so much. Uh, stay on the line here. I'm going to chat with you a second. Uh, I'm going to say bye to everyone else. Uh, thank you uh, for, for joining us. Again, if you have any questions uh, about this or any technologies we talked about or any of the positions we talked about, go to mikeonmoney.com, reach out to us, and uh, we're happy to answer those questions. And we'll talk to you next week.